This is not a deep Bible study. In fact, I could be accused of going down the road of uh, basic Christianity here. But in order to go forward with this message, I need to go back to the last time that I, I, I spoke here a few weeks ago. When I spoke a message that was called, Do You Really Want to Live in a Cave? And I was speaking about David before he became king. Um, and he was being pursued by the then king, Saul, who was trying to kill him. And he takes refuge in a cave called the Cave of Adullam. And when he comes to that cave, he's alone, he's frightened, he's beaten, he's broken, he's full of self-pity. And he calls out to God to sort things out. And his cry is recorded in a psalm that he wrote, which is called Psalm 142. And in the last verse of that, what he says, if I've got this up there, let's try that one. Yeah. Oops, that one. In the last verse of that cry, he says, Set me free from my prison that I may praise your name and the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. In other words, he calls for God to sort it out. And then things will be fine. And God tells him to wait because it doesn't work that way. What God wants to tell him is the outworkings of, of this scripture. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. In other words, you don't look for what you get. You don't sit at the back of the cave and wait for all these things to come to you so you feel confident enough to step out. You seek first the kingdom and everything that you need will come into your world. That's what we were talking about last time. But what I really want to look at here, how I want to take this forward, is what David was looking for there was effectively a testimony. And what we mean often by testimony, when people are, are called to do their testimony, they're always tend to think that what they're required to do is to say how I became a Christian. I used to be this, which was bad, and then God came into my life, and this is how that happened. This is what I am now, which is good, or at least better. The problem is, of course, that when we talk about testimony, we also talk about it within the, the way that the world looks at things. And these days, we are under the belief that we can only attract people's attention and get people listening if things are big, bold, and dramatic. Now, I'm old enough to kind of remember the, the old black and white cowboy movies where people got shot, and they fell off their horses, and they clutched their chest, but there was no blood. We didn't expect that. We didn't sit as kids and think, that's not very realistic, and don't believe he's dead, because we never believed he was. We used our imagination, but these days, of course, with computer graphics and CGI stuff and, and special effects, we can be convinced that it's almost real. Blood everywhere. Oh, that, that'll, that'll grab their attention. It looks real. Oh, his head's come off. He's not coming back from that one. That kind of stuff. And we take the same attitude into testimony. If a testimony is big, bold, and dramatic, that's a good testimony. You know... I was a crazed axe monster. Now I'm pastor in a church in Blackburn. <laughs> you know, then we're all right with that. But the testimony that begins, oh, I was brought up in a Christian household and I, I kind of went to church and I got involved with the youth group. We tend to think, no, no, no that, that's tame. We'll save that for quiet moments if we want to attract people and get their attention. No, we want something big, bold, and dramatic. And since Liz and I have been going into to prison, of course, we've come across a lot of people whose stories are exactly that. I mean, I've lived a very sheltered life. I managed to get to 67 without ever having had a fight of any shape or form. But now we're sitting in rooms with guys who ways of, of dealing with arguments sometimes to wallop someone with a lump hammer. So it's a whole new world there. So when these guys come out to prison, and they come to any kind of faith, they are food and drink for the churches that like this sort of stuff. And they'll bang them onto a stage with a microphone in front of an audience to tell their testimony because it's exciting, it's colorful, it's dramatic. And that, of course, can cause a problem, not just for the people doing it, because it can make them think that their credibility rests in their past, and they can build a ministry off the back of their testimony, 
But it creates levels of testimony where you've got the person with a good testimony and then you've got yours and mine. And we tend to clear the stage for the glory boys because we don't have a testimony that's worth sharing. And I've actually heard some Christians say that. I hope nobody asked me to do my testimony because I don't really have a testimony. And how sad is that? And also, how completely wrong. So what I want to do is to talk about testimony, not from the point of view of a biblical study chasing it through Scripture, but simply in a practical day-to-day understanding of it. And I want to do it by using something that we've come across in the work that we've been doing in prison, and that's something called the 12-step program. Now, if you've no awareness of the 12-step program, the 12-step program was something that was invented, devised in the 30s in America as a program to support people in alcoholic addiction. And it became the basis of support groups like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's now been used for all the kind of support groups all over the world, Narcotics Anonymous, NA, and so on. And what I want to do is to look at that program. It was originally a Christian program. So it has Christian spiritual principles. Though, of course, these days, things have been politically correct and altered in that particular way so that it allows people of no faith and different faith to participate. But it was essentially a Christian program. And when I first came across it, I was a bit skeptical because of the the change of the language. But I've started to realize over the the years as I've come across it that it is a brilliant program. As an introduction to a Christian journey and life, it is a fantastic program. It makes far more sense than a lot of things, even like things, Alpha courses and so on. They've got their place, but the 12-step program is a brilliant way of understanding your Christian journey. And everybody, all churches need to have some kind of awareness of a 12-step program. And so do do all people. Because it makes sense of your journey. And what I want to do is to look at one of those steps. And the step that I want to look at is step three. And I want to call this message, step three, the power of testimony. But the steps are numbered for a reason. They're not just random, they're numbered for a reason, so you can't look at step three without, in fact, looking at the steps one and two that precede it. And that's what I really want to do. Now, step one of the 12-step program says this. We admitted that we were powerless over our addictions, that our lives had become unmanageable. Now, there's not a single Christian sitting here who doesn't know that step, who hasn't had that step preached at them from the front of a church over the years or has read it in the opening chapters of a basic Christianity book. Not one. Except we'll probably recognize it a little bit better if we take out the word addictions and we put in the word sin. This idea that we have a sin problem. And that sin problem separates us from God. And that there is nothing that we can do about it in our own strength, that we cannot connect ourselves back to God in any way that we attempt. We can read the Bible all we like, we can come to church on a regular basis, we can do good deeds, we can give money to charity, we can be a wonderful person, but you cannot connect yourself back to God in anything that you do in your own strength. Now, you know that. We are powerless over our sin problem. Now, just a minute. I think I've left something out here, just a sec. Right. Yeah, we are disconnected from the one who designed us, who created us, who has a plan and a purpose for our life. Therefore, we are a little bit like we're driving a car around a city and we are trying to find something within this city. And this thing that we're looking for is called a place where we belong, a place where we feel secure, a place where our life makes sense. 
and we drive around this city, but we're not quite sure where this place is. We just think it's out there somewhere. And so we try down various little roads. We turn down a little road that's called the road of relationships. Perhaps relationships will find this, this place where we belong. And when that doesn't work, we try down possessions. We try down a job. We try down the road of, of materialism. We see little roads where people are, are wandering down. And there's loads of them. We think, oh, that's a popular road. Perhaps it's down there. And we're led around by, by fashion, by things that we should possess. Or oh, you'll be all right if you possess this. We're constantly looking for this place where we belong, somewhere in this journey of life, driving around. But we can't find it. Because it's not in that city. You know what I'm saying? It's not in that city. We can try all the things that we like. And some of those roads take people down the road called addiction. Trying to find something that makes sense in their life to block out this pain, this emptiness that lies within each one of us. And that's what people who have not accepted step one, that's your life. Driving around looking for a place where you belong. And just hoping that somehow you'll stumble on it. Think of the roads that it takes people down. I'll take it down to the gym where I'll pump iron to build a body. Because so, perhaps if I look good on the outside, I'll feel better about myself on the inside. Or it will take me down to the tanning salon for the same reason. If I can look good on the outside, perhaps I'll start to feel better about myself. But we drive and we drive and we drive and we still never find what we're looking for. Because we're looking in the wrong place. Because the place that we're looking for is not a place within a city. It's a person and a relationship with that person. And we need to understand that all our efforts to try and find this place where we belong are never going to deal with it. And that's the sort of thing that we're dealing with with people out in society. That's what it's like to live a life separated from God. There was a poet called Philip Larkin that used to do at A-level. I don't think he was come across Philip Larkin's work, but he was an atheist. He understood the, the problem of human beings. He just never understood the solution. And he wrote about life, and he said this, Life is first boredom, then fear. Whether or not we use it, it goes, and leaves what something hidden from us chose, and then age, and then the only end of age. See, life is first boredom. Just driving around in a little circle, thinking, what am I doing? And then fear of losing it. No wonder people have midlife crises. They get halfway through their life and they think, where am I going? How did I get here? Whether or not we use it, it just ticks away. And it's almost like we, we're not in control of it. It's like something that's hidden from us out there chose our life for us. And then age. And then the only end of age. Now, Larkin understood the human problem, but he never understood the solution. But that's what a lot of people see in life. But that's it. Now, how sad is that? And I think there are a lot of Christians in church who haven't fully accepted step one. Because step one, if you don't accept step one, your life will not work for you in that particular way. They're still trying to find their security in church, in a, in a ministry in the security of coming to church each week. They have never accepted step one. Until you accept step one, there is no progress. See, there's an illustration also we use sometimes in prison, and that's of a TV set. A big flat screen telly, or one of these curved screen tellies you see these days. Thousands of quid's worth. And we can get excited about it, and we can look at the manual and think, wow, that's brilliant, look at all the things it can do. But until that television is plugged into a power source, it can't even begin to deliver what it was created for. And neither can you or I. Until we are connected back into God, we have no chance of, of achieving what we were created to achieve. And until we accept step one, we're not even in the game. See... Step one says this, stop, stop driving around, park up your car in this search around this city, turn the engine off, take your hands off the wheel, 
Put your hands in the air instead and simply say the words, I surrender. I give up. I cannot do this thing. I need help. See, if it was only the first step, If it was only the one step, not the 12 step, and that was the end of it, then the world is like Philip Larkin describes. And that's the world for a lot of people. Boredom, fear, searching for something, age, death. That's it. If it was only the the one step. But it isn't, of course. There's a second step. And step two says this. We came to believe that a power greater than us could restore us to sanity. Now, there's the 12-step language, and I've left it in because I don't want to manipulate anybody. A power greater than us, a higher power. Now, that freaked me out first, and we kind of think, hang on, you can't talk about a power greater than us. It's only Jesus. It's only God. But I'm okay with that. The more that I think about that, there are lots of people who are on a journey who don't believe what I believe. And I'm not going to walk into their world and tell them that they're, they're, they're rubbish, that their ideas are wrong, because that would shut the door on any kind of argument. They're on a spiritual journey. They're looking for something, and at least they've accepted step one. There's lots of people who don't do that. And at least they know they need help. And when you work through the 12 steps, you'll discover that any God other than the one that we know, the God of the Bible, the man who went on to the cross for us, doesn't work. So I'll leave them to come to that conclusion on their own. But we know that the God of our understanding, the power greater than us, is Jesus. And in fact, what you're looking at there are Jesus' last words on earth. The last thing that Jesus said on earth was step two. The last words that Jesus said on earth were, may God give you peace. Same thing. May God give you peace. May God restore you to sanity. May God take the chaos of our life and make sense of it. So what it is, the picture going back to our car, is we put our hands in the air and we say, look, I surrender, I give up. And God says, fine, now put your hands back on the wheel. Don't get out of the car. It's not a question of inviting God into the driving seat because that would just make you a passenger. No, put your hands back on the wheel and I'm going to give you a sat-nav. And we'll call that sat-nav the Holy Spirit. And we'll have a manual for that sat-nav. We'll call it the Bible. Now, I know that the Holy Spirit is much more than a sat-nav. But for the purposes of our car picture, it will work fine. Because there are three things you need to do if you have a sat-nav. One is you need to trust it. If you don't trust your sat-nav, why follow its directions? But the Holy Spirit is a brilliant sat-nav. It knows exactly where you are, even if you don't. You may be lost, but the Holy Spirit, the sat-nav, knows exactly where you are, what you're thinking, what you need, why you are. The second thing that you do with a sat-nav is to put in a destination. Where are you actually trying to get to? And I'm not sure that a lot of Christians have actually done that bit. Where are you trying to get to in your Christian journey? What do you want to be? We're not talking about heaven here. We're talking about life here. What do you want to be? Do you want to be a Christian who kind of sits at the back of a church every Sunday and twiddles their thumbs? Does nothing else? So where are you trying to get to? What sort of Christian life do you want? Well, I mean, you could put in things like fruits of the Spirit in Galatians, I suppose. Would you like a life of peace, joy, love, kind, that sort of thing? That sounds good. Put that in. What about this stuff that Jamie says sometimes about the teens in this church putting us to shame with their their commitment and their passion? Would you like that? Would you like to be a little bit more like them? Would you like to reignite that passion and that fire in your life that seems to have died? Would you like that? We'll put that into your destination. then. Put that into your sat-nav. That's where you're trying to get to. Now, once you've got a destination into it, then pull out into traffic and start the journey. Now, the third thing that a sat-nav does, of course, it doesn't tell you the whole journey, does it? If if you're trying to follow a sat-nav from here to, to London, it will not tell you the whole journey, but it will tell you the next step. It will tell you the next decision that you make. Once you get to that T-junction, just down the road, 
turn left because that's the best way to get to your destination. You can turn right if you want because it's your hands on the wheel. But the next thing is that you may think, I'm lost. I've got to go back. So it's a choice. At that T-junction, you make a choice, your own choice, between turning left, following the voice of the sat-nav, or turning right and following your own choice. And at that T-junction, which way are you going to go? And guess what? That's step three. Step three says this, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Well, we understand who God is. We turn our care, that we turn our lives over to the will and care of God as we understood him. In other words, we submit our lives to the will of God. That's step three. Step one, you can't. Step two, God can. Step three, in which case, do what he says. How simple do we want to make this stuff? Step one, you can't do this stuff. Step two, accept Jesus as Savior. It's the only way. And step three, now start to accept him as Lord and direct in your life. Now, here's the catch. And it's only a small catch. Step three... At that T-junction where you've got a choice between do I go the way of the sat-nav or do I go my own way, only happens when there's conflict. See, 90% of the time, we'd probably turn the way of the sat-nav anyway, wouldn't we? Because we're not lousy people. We're not wicked people. We tend to do what the right thing most of the time. But it allows a lot of people to say, well, 90% of the time, I do what God wants. But that really means that 100% of the time I do what I want. The 90% I was going to do anyway, and the 10% where I've got a, a bit of a conflict, I'm going to do my own thing. So therefore, I'm a good person, because I live fairly morally. But what it means is I do what I want all the time. That's not what it's about. Step three happens when there is a real conflict. You want to go this way, and the sat -nav says, turn that way. And you've got to fight on your hands. Which way am I going to go? Now, I said that this was called, step three, the power of testimony. Now, what's that got to do with it? Well, it's simple this. Every time that you win a step three battle at that T-junction, every time that you turn left, despite what your own self-will wanted to do, is part of your testimony. Because you're turning left for no other reason than you're trusting in the promises of God. You're seeking the kingdom. Now, it may not be a big thing. It may not be a dramatic glory boy kind of testimony where you're going to run to the front of the church and say, oh, let me speak through a microphone about telling what I've done. But it means that day by day, decision by decision, you are bringing your life into line with the way that God wants you to go. And that's significant to me. I think that's significant. It may not be a dramatic testimony, but it speaks of a change in you. I'll give you an example from my own experience here of a little minor battle, and that's shopping trolleys. I had a battle with shopping trolleys. I would come out of Asda, park the, the shopping trolley at the back of the, the car, empty all the shopping in, and then if I suddenly thought, hang on, I parked miles away from that little bay where you're supposed to put the shopping trolleys, or it's raining, it's cold, I'm in a bit of a hurry, I would kind of sneak it down to the front of the car, back up, and leave it for somebody else to do. Until one day I drove into Asda, nice parking space that I wanted to go into, and I had to slam the brakes on, stuck right in the middle of it, was a shopping trolley. <laughs> and I thought, what selfish individual does a thing like this? And God said very quietly, well, someone just like you. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, fair enough. And from that day... I have never, promise this, I have never ever left a shopping trolley of any shape or size in any store anywhere else other than where it should be. I don't care how far I've got to go. I even take other people's. I'm obsessed. <laughs> it has now become part of my nature to do that. I don't even have to think about it anymore. Now, you may think, hang on, that's a bit 
tame. That's not like a dramatic... And you're absolutely right, of course. I'm not going to write a book about it. <laughs> I'm not going to ask Jamie for the microphone and say, oh, let me tell you about the battle I had in, in Tesco on, on Saturday with me shopping trolley. But it has become part of my nature, and therefore it's part of my testimony, because it means that... Because when I think about it, what was the reason I left the shopping trolley there in the first place? Well, very simple. Selfishness. I was thinking of me, not others. Therefore, it was a small victory, but in a big battle. In the battle we fight on a day-to-day -day basis. The battle against self. Selfishness. Therefore, having won that battle, so it is no longer a step three for me, because it's become part of that 90% I do automatically, I am actually a slightly less selfish person than I was before. Or if you want to be dead spiritual about it, I am slightly more like Jesus than I was before. Not much to write home about, just a tiny bit. But how many tiny steps do you need to take before you've made progress? And after that came other step three battles in the, in the course of it, like going into prison. I didn't want to go into prison. I was scared. I was a snob. I thought, I don't want to mix with these sort of people. I have nothing to offer them. But God said, go in. So in the end, we went in. I didn't want to preach. God says, preach. I think, no, I don't want to. I can't talk to adults. I'll fall about. I'll stutter. I'll, I'll get it wrong. I can only talk to kids. I'm all right with that as a teacher. But I can't talk to adults. God said, preach. So you do that. And things like that change your life. But I would be kidding myself to think I could win the big battles against stuff like that if I can't win a little battle against shopping trolleys. And I face those battles in different ways, and so do you, day after day after day. You'll face them today. You might face them before the end of this message if I call, ask people to come forward for prayer. You might say, oh, do I turn left and go forward for prayer and get something in my life sort it out, or do I turn right and head for the coffee? For that, it might be a, a step three battle for you. Well, which way are you going to go? See, we wait for the glory boy events, the praying for somebody and raising from the dead and all that kind of stuff, the dramatic thing. But our testimony is being built decision by decision by decision. Not as dramatic as the glory boy testimonies, but I tell you what, far more real. See, the Bible, if you look at it, is full of step three battles because it's full of people making decisions to do what God wants or not to. And we know some of the big names, the battles that Gideon fought to lead his nation when all he wanted to be was a nice family man, the battles that Moses fought to lead the people free from Pharaoh. And all the arguments he comes into, he gives God as why he shouldn't do it. These big battles. But if you look at the Bible, it's full of people, ordinary people, making little decisions to do what God wants or not to do it. But of course, there's one step three victory. Or there's one step three battle that became a victory that is the biggest step three battle in all of history, isn't there? The biggest step three battle in whole of human history and the most significant one is, of course, this one. Version in Mark chapter 14. Jesus in Gethsemane. I'll just read that quickly. We know the story, but it's there in all the Gospels. They went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now, Jesus has just done the, the Last Supper. Judas has gone off to, to betray him, to arrange everything for Jesus' arrest. Jesus takes the disciples, and they think they're going back to the village of Bethany for an overnight sleep and a nice, cozy place. Instead, he takes them to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he waits. And he waits to be arrested. 
He knows if he waits there long enough that all the things will be organized and people will arrest him and the next stop from that is the cross, is the trial and the cross and crucifixion. This is a T-junction. Everything in Jesus would say, come on, can I turn right? Can I wake the disciples up and head back to Bethany? I don't want to do this. This is going to hurt. This is going to be awful. Can I turn right, Father, and go a different way? I don't want to go to the cross. I have a choice to make. At any moment, while he's waiting, Jesus could have woken those disciples up and said, come on, let's go. I can't do this. It's unfair to ask anybody to do this sort of thing. He sweats blood. He's in anguish to the point of death. God sends him an angel to strengthen him. It says, I think it's in Luke's version. And sometimes that happens at a T-junction. Somebody will be sent to strengthen you, to help you in your decision. I didn't need anybody to strengthen me in the battle against shopping trolleys. It wasn't important enough. But I did need a little bit of help to go into prison or a little bit of help to to first preach. God did send somebody into my world just to help me and encourage me. But the one thing these people sent into your world can't do is make the decision for you. It's your hands on the wheel. Which way are you going to turn it, left or right? God could send Jesus an angel to strengthen him, but he can't turn the wheel for it. So Jesus has to make that decision on his own. And when he says, yet not my will, but yours be done, that's step three. In a nutshell, in a line, that is step three. Not my will, but yours be done. See, That victory cancels out the biggest step three defeat in history, doesn't it? Lost by Adam, when Adam faced a decision at a T-junction, turn left, says God, walk in fellowship with me, don't turn right and go to that tree and eat of the fruit. But Adam lost his battle and turned right. The world and the flesh and the devil gathered at that T-junction to make him, to help him, to encourage him to do the wrong thing. But in the end, he turned the wheel. And Jesus' victory cancels that defeat out. Two men, Adam and Jesus, two gardens, Eden and Gethsemane, two trees, one fashioned into the shape of a cross. Two men, two garden, two trees, two step threes. One victory cancelling out the defeat. And aren't you glad he did? Aren't you glad he turned left? See, sometimes I reckon that when we just done communion and we take the wine and we take the blood and we, we take the bread and we take the wine and we say, we do this in remembrance of you, I think sometimes it would be good to have the same attitude towards our step three challenges. That I win this battle in remembrance of the battle that you won for me in Gethsemane. Because although Jesus died on the cross, He died first in Gethsemane. Because he died to self. And that's what step three is about. Dying to yourself. So when I look at it, my battle against shopping trolleys fades a bit into insignificance, really. I should win that battle in remembrance of what Jesus did. And it's an easy battle to win. Just takes a little bit of discipline. I should win the battle against preaching. I should win the battle about going into prison. What other battles should we win in remembrance of the big one that Jesus won in Gethsemane? And perhaps if we had that attitude to our step three battles, then we'd change our thinking a bit and we'd probably say, don't sort it out for me, God. Don't just do it all for me, God. Give me more step three challenges. Give me the opportunity to get my character in line with the way that you want me to go. Let me stop making the excuses not to do what I know I should be doing. See, there's one final lesson that we could learn from this, I think, because I tried to keep it practical here. There's one final lesson. What can we learn to apply into our own thinking from what Jesus did in Gethsemane? 
How can we encourage ourselves to win the, the battle, the step three battles from what Jesus did? Why did Jesus win that battle? Well, the answer is motivation. The answer is motivation. He wanted to get to his destination badly enough. See, if you're, motiva if you're motivated, you will go through all kinds of hardship. You're not going to queue up for two hours in the freezing cold to get a daily newspaper outside your newsagent. But you might queue all night for our flat screen telly for a tenner in a January sale if you think that the, it was worth it. Whatever the destination is, how desperately you want to get to the destination is going to affect how much you're going to go through, isn't it? How much you're prepared to put yourself through. So Jesus must have wanted to get to that destination badly enough. What was Jesus' destination? Well, it wasn't the cross, was it? That wouldn't motivate anybody. What was Jesus' destination that motivated him so passionately to sweat blood, to be so frightened, to be close to death in his head, but he still turned left? What was his destination? Well, you know what his destination was? Christine, it was you. It was Christine. When Jesus prayed in Gethsemane that day he saw Christine the only problem was that Christine was the other side of the cross and she was alone and Jesus thought how do I get to her and he prays a step three to his father can I turn right father and go around the houses go all that way around and still get to Christine and save her because she's alone. And the father said, no, it's, it's got to be that. In which case, not my will but yours be done. And in the next blink of an eye, he saw Mark. And he saw Lynn. And he saw Chris. And he saw Jamie. And he saw Jay. And he saw Liz, and he saw David. He saw Anna, he saw Mike. You know what I'm saying. And each one of you was alone. Didn't come as a job lot. You were alone. And there's no way to get to you without going through that cross. And when we look at it that way, shopping trolleys, that Jesus went through that to get to me, I would have done so even if I'd been the only one. We know that. See, the question is, how desperate are you to get to your destination? The destination you put into your sat -navs. We can all put the destination in. I want a life. I want that peace, joy, love. Oh, I'd love that fruits of the spirit stuff. Gifts of the spirit. Yeah, that's great. I want to be as passionate as the teens. I want that fire lit again. But how desperate are you to get there? How desperate are you? Because if you're desperate, it's bring on the step three battles. Because I need to get there. I need to turn left. I need to go the way of the sat -nav. How desperate are you really to get to the destination that you want to get to? Because that will determine how many of these battles that you win. See... David got his testimony in the end, didn't he? In the cave of Adullam. It just wasn't the testimony he was looking for. He was waiting for a glory boy testimony where he could stop at the back of the cave and God would do it all for him till the situation was changed and he felt he could come out. But God didn't give him that testimony. He gave him a step three. You can stop at the back of the cave, David. You can turn right and stop there and wait for me to do it or you can turn left and go to the front of the cave and seek the kingdom and these things will come to you. Turn right, turn left. David turned left. Jesus turned left. Which way do you go when you face the next battle? God bless you, church. I will leave it there. Thank you, Jamie.